Okay, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Nini Hicklin, and I'm the program coordinator for the Charter for Compassion. And I'm so happy to be here with you all today. We, uh, we hold these compassionate community webinars monthly, and every month it is one of the things that I most look forward to. Today, we have the pleasure of hearing from Compassionate Houston, Texas. Pam, Barbara, and Ted will share about the community's 10-year history, the unique characteristics that come with the size and diversity of Houston, the aims, programs, and network in place currently, and some of the challenges that they have faced. I want to take care of a few quick housekeeping items before we get going. Uh, the webinar is being recorded, so everybody who registered will receive a copy of that recording in their email in the next day or two. So look out for that in your inbox. Uh, we are planning for about 15 minutes or so of Q&A at the end of the session. So as Pam, Barbara, and Ted uh, give their presentation. If any questions or comments come up for you, go ahead and drop them in chat where I'll be keeping track of them. Um, to access the chat, just hover over the bottom of your Zoom screen and there's a little chat icon and it'll come up. Um, for me, it's on the right of my, my Zoom window. I will also be uh, dropping some relevant links and resources there in chat. So be sure to keep an eye out. I think that's it. So I'm gonna hand it over to the Compassionate Houston team. Please enjoy their presentation. Thank you, Mimi. And good morning from Houston, Texas, everyone. I'm Pam Lewis. I'm the board chair of Compassionate Houston, and we are really grateful to Mimi and Marilyn at the Charter for inviting us to share our Compassionate City with you today. We love how these community webinars give us a chance to connect with others around the globe and to learn from each other, and that's definitely our goal for today as well. I would like to introduce two other Compassionate Houston board members who will be joining me. Mimi has um, already introduced them, but Barbara Homan is our Vice President of Communications and Ted Isensey is our Treasurer. And even though um, we all have these titles, they don't begin to describe the many hats we wear um, all the time and I'm sure Others around the world in compassionate cities have that same experience. So our plan for today is for the three of us to present for a total of about 40 minutes and then to open it up to question and answers. And I'll start by introducing our history, our mission, our structure, and something about the soil in which compassionate Houston is existing. Barbara will talk about our programs and accomplishments. So you might think of those as the harvests or fruits of our labors. And then Ted will be discussing our plans going forward, what new seeds we might be planting and also our past and present challenges. So with that, I am going to share my screen and take us to the Compassionate Houston website. Is that visible to everyone? Great. Um, I hope you'll have a chance to come back at another time and look more deeply into our website because we'll just be scratching the surface today. But Barbara is the person largely responsible for keeping it fresh and up to date. And we're very grateful to her for that. So let's begin by looking at our mission, history and mission. And as you can see from this screen, Compassionate Houston is a 501c3 organization, it was founded in 2011 by the Reverend Betty Adam and a nucleus of co-founders. And that was about 15 months after the charter itself was launched. So we were the first compassionate city in Texas. And as Mimi mentioned, we are celebrating our 10th anniversary this year. 
always our mission has been to grow the compassionate culture of greater Houston, as it says in that first sentence there. So Betty and the early co-founders undertook a number of grassroots projects with the city of Houston. And the success of those allowed us to be designated a compassionate city in 2015 by then mayor Anise Parker. And then that designation was reaffirmed in 2017 by Mayor Sylvester Turner. And along with our partners, we have four major objectives through which we work toward our mission. And those are right here. They include to provide and support compassion skills, education and practice across our city and the region to provide opportunities for individuals and partners to network, thereby focusing or fostering innovative and synergistic solutions toward community needs. Third, to foster initiatives that nurture and intercultural relationships and understanding. And fourth, to recognize innovative, compassion-focused individuals and group projects. And as I mentioned, we do these things with our network of partners. So let me introduce those. On this screen, you can see the approximately 30 partners with whom Compassionate Houston collaborates to meet our missions and, and theirs as well. If you glance at the list of partners, you may notice that there are a variety of both small and large faith communities included, also practice groups, also nonprofits of many types, including educational interests in mental health issues, and uh, meditation and many other, many other such missions among our partners. And also um, Barbara will be explaining in much more detail how we meet our missions, our mission with these partners. But I would like to point out that some of them like Interfaith Ministries for Greater Houston are pretty large umbrella organizations themselves. And now, let me share what the requirements are, really not requirements, but how it is that one joins the movement and becomes a partner of Compassionate Houston. Here on our website, we also have the basic guidelines for anyone who might wish to join our network. They're pretty straightforward. It's basically four steps, beginning with reading the information about the charter on our website, including the text of the charter, reading the information about Compassionate Houston and our aims on our website and deciding which aims the organization is most aligned with. Third, affirming and signing the, the charter for Compassion. And then fourth, deciding how perhaps in their first year, the organization may wish to collaborate with Compassion at Houston or support our mission. And uh, those can be simple one or two things. They involve the programs that Barbara will be describing later. And with that, <clears throat> I believe that we could take a look now at our board. This page uh, shows photographs of our 10 current board members of Compassionate Houston. And typically our board is comprised over the years of 10 to 12 board members. Our founder, Betty Adam, we are so happy remains on our board, an ongoing resource for us and inspiration. And next to her is Bob Boothorn. He was also a founding member of Compassionate Houston. And Bob is the photographer that took these unique photos of our board members. 
And behind each unique photo is a unique biography for that board member. And we do always suggest, oops, I've just lost it. I think I lost it, right? Is the, it's gone, okay. Let me see if I can bring it back up. Now, is it sharing now or yes, do I need to? Yes. Great, okay. Uh, we do ask when people join our board that they commit to at least one three-year term. And I would also like to say that our board is a working board. We have no paid Compassionate Houston staff members. We meet through our midst and our internal skills. Most all of the program needs we have, and we do occasionally bring in a contractor for special specific needs. And so with that explanation, I'm going to stop sharing now. <clears throat> and talk with you just a little bit about the soil in which Compassionate Houston is planted, which to me sort of addresses the question, what makes Compassionate Houston tick? Or what helped shape us to be the way we are today? And using that metaphor of cultivating soil, I would just like to talk about the soil in which Compassionate Houston was planted, has been cultivated over these past 10 years, and is really organically growing. So let's start with size. The city of Houston's population from the 2020 census is said to be 2.3 million, and that is up 10% from the 2020 census. In the larger metro area, the population is 7.1 million. Houston is the fourth largest city in the US and the most diverse overall. Another factor of the soil in which we're planted is our growing diversity. Houston is the second fastest growing city in the US among the 10 largest US cities. And between the 2010 and 2020 census, the area's white resident population continued to decline. And because we are a hub for international migration, the area witnessed large gains in Latino and Asian residents, and more than 145 languages are spoken here, and we are the lucky recipients of the most diverse array of wonderful restaurants imaginable. Another factor is our geography. Houston contains 669 square miles although the greater Houston area contains more than 10,000 square miles. That is a layer, an area larger than many US states. And we have this location on the Gulf Coast of Texas, which makes us a magnet for a number of natural disasters such as floods and hurricanes but it, those things also have given the area a lot of practice in looking out for each other in crises. And that includes neighbors such as those in Louisiana and sort of a back and forth help that has gone on for many years. And then another factor in our soil really are our community resources. At the time of Compassionate Houston's founding 10 years ago, there was already in place a broad and very rich array of nonprofits, faith communities, agencies to meet important human needs, agencies to advance quality of life issues, to focus on growing religious tolerance, on the appreciation of human rights, and helping settle refugees, just to name several. Many of those organizations were among our co-founders 
and they remain partners of Compassionate Houston today. There are actually in total more than 30,000 uh, nonprofits operating in Greater Houston now. So from this description that I've given alone, Houston could be said to have more in common with small nations or countries than small cities. And so the question is, what do we see as our unique purpose or value? What do we add? Well, to continue that metaphor about the soil, we continuously fertilize that soil into which we were planted 10 years ago. We serve as sort of a glue or a bonding agent for like-minded individuals and like-minded organizations and as advocates for the value, the universal value of compassion as the charter defines it. And I would say that increasingly we are becoming also a voice for the cultivation of compassion as it's understood and structured in compassionate integrity training. And that focuses on things such as societal paradigm shifts and science and neuroscience findings of the past 20 years. All of those truly inspire realistic hope and provide practical new tools for us to spread compassion's reach outward, potentially turning millions of diverse citizens into real neighbors. And so that is really the vision under which we are operating. And thank you for your attention. Uh, please enter any comments or suggestions you may have in the chat. And now I'll turn it over to Barbara. Well, yeah, thank you, Pam. What a beautiful introduction. Um, so I'm delighted to share my screen and um, share uh, some of our program highlights with uh, everyone. Um, there are several cornerstone events that Compassionate Houston offers on an annual basis, and I would like to start with those. And then I will give you a brief overview on additional offerings, um, events, and resources. Let's start with our annual luncheon, and I will scroll down here to see for you to see some images of our 2019 um, luncheon. So at each of our luncheons, we recognize innovative individuals and group projects. And these local compassionate visionaries share their stories then to a large audience. And you can see in some of the images, the great attendance uh, of our luncheons. In past years, we have also invited keynote speakers to speak on a specific topic. We were, for example, honored a few years ago to host Dr. Kristen Neff, a pioneer in self-compassion research, as well as Dr. James Doty, founder and director of Stanford University's Center for Compassion and Altruism. Dr. Doty was also so kind to work with us last year during our uh, annual virtual Compassion Week. I will speak more on this shortly. Um, so the annual luncheon uh, provides plenty of opportunities to network and Pam mentioned our four aims with the second aim being to, to network. And that means to build bridges and building bridges, you know, uh, results in expanding compassion further in our city. Uh, we had to cancel our 2020 and this year's annual luncheon due to COVID and just signed the contract uh, for a new date in April of next year. So keep our fingers crossed uh, that we are able to hold another in-person uh, luncheon. Um, another key, let me scroll down and I try to do this slowly so we don't get dizzy here. Uh, another key and reoccurring event is our annual Compassion Week uh, that kicks off in October. So this year's week is just around the corner and we are busy getting this uh, rolling. Uh, before COVID, Compassion Week was always a collaboration with our partners, where we offer partners um, programs, events, workshops, lectures, readings, meditations on a variety of topics, all tied to compassion, mindfulness, compassionate actions. 
And usually we offer about two to three per day over a seven day uh, time period. And for Compassion Week 2020, we really had to think outside the box. Um, a lot of partners struggled themselves at that time to actually offer events. And let me click on the, the page of Compassion Week. Um, so last year, um, we offered an entire, let me scroll down to the bottom. Again, please don't get busy here. Here you go. Um, so last year we offered a, an, an entire virtual uh, event um, over seven days that consisted of three pillars with the first one being a daily dose of compassion, uh, consisting of daily compassionate activities, a daily poem and a daily reflection slash meditation uh, slash contemplation. And we shared those daily doses um, on our website, on Facebook, and also send daily news blasts. Uh, and the second pillar of uh, last week's Compassion Week were brief live virtual interfaith readings and reflections of the Charter for Compassion by 24 members of our diverse um, partner organizations. And then the third pillar, uh, was a conversation between Dr. James Doty. You see him here on the left side of uh, the, the YouTube um, and uh, an executive director of the Jung Center who is one of our partner organization, uh, followed by a live Q and A with the online audience and the speakers. If you have a chance to check out our website, you don't want to miss this um, truly thought provoking and heartfelt conversation between um, Dr. Dodi and Sean Fitzpatrick on the power of empathy and compassion. Um, so let's head back to our um, homepage where I uh, listed um, highlights um, from 2021 as well as 2020. Um, <clears throat> uh, in January of this year, PEM moderated a charter uh, webinar um, showcasing the great work that Compassionate Pakistan is doing. I already shared with you the Compassionate, uh, the charter readings of uh, 24 um, Compassionate leaders. Uh, that's available for you also to, uh, to check out the entire um, six days that we offered those uh, readings. And then uh, we co-sponsored an event with the Jung Center, one of our partners where we were promoting an evening with the gentleman you see here in the picture, and Anthony Hinton, who was uh, imprisoned uh, or sitting on death row for 30 years for a crime he did not commit. And uh, finally, uh, we started uh, the Collective Heart Campaign uh, in 2020 uh, in support of community members who lost their job due to COVID and found themselves in a situation where they were not able to pay rent and pay for basic uh, needs. So the board decided to kickstart our campaign with $5,000 and then we raised uh, 5,000 more, uh, ended up with $10,000 that we were able to donate to an organization who serves family um, throughout the region. Um, here comes a huge highlight uh, for all of us in, um, fall of uh, 2019, uh, the mayor of Houston, as this gentleman here in the middle, um, signed a proclamation uh, declaring November 12, 2019, the Charter for Compassion 10th anniversary day in Houston. That was a very proud moment for the board and uh, also for our partners. Some of our partners visited uh, with us, uh, the, visited the mayor and some city council members and we received the proclamation uh, in celebration, as the slide says, says, you know, celebrating 10 years of compassion in action, celebrating the Charter for Com Compassion. And so that fall was uh, truly, you know, continuing a highlight of um, our time as Karen Armstrong herself visited Houston for a lecture. And um, here we see uh, Karen Armstrong and uh, David, the executive director of the charter, you know, so kind to post with Pam and our proclamation for a picture that we will, uh, that we hold very dear to us. So what else do we do? We um, send out regular newsletters 
We maintain this website. We maintain a Facebook uh, page that keeps on growing. Currently, we have 1,270 followers. We added a new section to the website to highlight key events and kind of mark your calendar happenings, not only for Compassionate Houston and our partners, but also to keep folks up to date on any um, happenings in Houston related to uh, shared humanity and compassionate action. And then uh, as we are, as Pam said, a collaborative network of partner organization, uh, we feature and that way promote uh, our partner events on our website. This show you a snippet of how the page looks like. So we um, market those events, not only on uh, the website, but also on Facebook and vice versa. Several of our partners um, will also share our events on their social media platforms. And that part really requires a lot of collaboration and ongoing conversation to keep that going. Um, we added another offering to the website under our, um, under our resources uh, page, um, where we um, share additional uh, compassionate uh, resources to the community. And um, the top part of that page uh, usually highlights um, a certain um, resources. Currently, we um, uh, are highlighting our collaboration with a visual and literary arts uh, organization who explores the theme of uh, compassion through 19 pairings of visual art and poems in collaboration with the uh, Holocaust Museum uh, Houston. And so you have access to their exhibition through our uh, website. Uh, back at the beginning of the pandemic, that top part of our uh, resources uh, page was filled with um, uh, resources, tips, advice to stay sane, uh, to, to, to improve our well being, and to be mentally strong uh, during the uh, pandemic. So let's head back to our um, homepage. So I hope it's okay, me switching back and forth to bring your attention what else is going on. And as Pam already mentioned, one of our aims is education. And we do this as an example with our Compassionate Integrity Training, CIT. Um, so for we are offering now, coming up in October as well, very busy fall ahead of us, uh, our fourth um, CIT class. And this class will be uh, quite an experience for us. Uh, Pam and I are facilitating this class. It will be a hybrid class in collaboration also with a partner. Uh, participants have an option to either sign up uh, to attend online or uh, in person. Um, so let's see how this works out. And um, a quick word about a project that um, is mainly PEMS, uh, based on PEMS initiative, the project Kindness in collaboration with the Houston Community College, a large uh, community college here in, in Houston. It started as a Compassion Week project back in 2015, when PEM paired senior living residents with adult volunteers to interview the seniors on two simple questions. Number one, what's the kindest thing that uh, another person has done to you? And question number two, what's the kindest thing I have ever done for another? And so last summer, fast forward five years later, the Houston Community College or the Houston Community Honor College was looking for a virtual alternative for students' community service requirement. And so they reached out to PEM and PEM's idea led to the pairing of students with a senior citizen home you know, following the same interview question. And it was a huge uh, success. One student claimed that it was truly the highlight of her experience at college. And a senior commented that she had such an inspired view of youth and stated, quote, uh, there's no need to worry about the future of our society. And so I want to say, way to go Pam for, you know, initiating such a beautiful jump. So this project is further expanding to potentially involve a kindness hour. And I sometimes have a hard time to actually keep track on how it uh, expands and evolves. So 
feel free to ask per many for any details during our Q and A, or if you have, are curious about such a project and want to implement it in your area of uh, the world, wherever you are calling from, you know, please send us an an, an email. And so I'd like to end. Uh, I like to end my part by sharing our very appreciated um, compassion through the arts event um, that aired back in June. Uh, this year with a second showing in, in August. And so these, the idea for this event was born out of several considerations. You know, we were not able to offer an in-person luncheon two years in a row to our community. Uh, secondly, we felt that we really needed a, a to boost positivity. And lastly, Compassionate Houston is celebrating its 10 year anniversary this, this year. So we wanted to share something special with the community. And we created this one hour long uh, film or a little bit more than one hour um, uh, produced by one of our board members who is a film producer, you know, lucky us. Uh, in this program, we celebrate compassion through the arts and we feature internationally acclaimed and local inspiring artists who share music, poetry, visual arts, which also includes us uh, two, two local street artists to really showcase the, the beauty and power of compassion. And the event kicked off a grant to recognize and encourage um, local emerging artists who highlight compassion through their creative expression in the greater Houston area. And Ted will speak more on that uh, uh, shortly. Um, let me just switch over to the uh, updated lending side. Our event, as Pam mentioned, and then I said, it was the, um, this event also celebrated our 10 year anniversary. And so of course this came with honoring our, um, uh, our founder, the Reverend uh, Betty, Betty Adam. We have some really heartwarming footage on her sharing the early beginnings of Compassionate Houston and truly the awe that she feels now in recognizing how far her initial steps have taken the organization. And as a gift to you, we would like to share the link to our YouTube uh, recording with everyone and invite you to watch this colorful program, Compassion Through the Arts. So thank you for listening. And if you have any questions um, on our programs on marketing, please put them in the chat or of course, again, send an email. I will now hand it over to Ted. Thank you, everyone. Great, thank you, Barbara. I'm going to talk a little bit more about some of the things that have already been mentioned, but focusing mainly on what we plan to do in the next, uh, eight months or so. So let me share a little presentation with you here. So talking about our plans for the future. Let me just do this. Okay. Can you see that screen? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Excellent. All right. So one of the things that we decided to do after the event that Barbara just talked about compassion via the arts program, we decided that we wanted to continue that momentum. And so we wanted to support the idea, not just the idea, but the practice of artists sharing work that promotes, develops, encourage, expresses compassion. And the way that we decided to do that is to come up with a grant for just to start off with for three artists and we have selected a committee of artists to join several people on the board to select these artists and we're not looking at artists that are already widely recognized such as Beyonce in Houston uh, she probably doesn't need our our help in that regard but we're looking at artists that have already accomplish things with their art and deserve greater recognition. And so we'll be raising funds. We don't know exactly how much, but we're focused on raising perhaps as much as $15,000 or more to, to give to these artists. 
We also, going forward, will continue to have our Compassion Week. As Barbara mentioned, that's coming up in October. And since we're still in the midst of this COVID uh, you know, crisis or pandemic, that will have to be some combination of in-person maybe and also virtual. We also will continue the compassionate integrity training that has already been talked about. And that's gonna be most likely, a, well, will be a hybrid event there. We are looking at some initiative to perhaps have a, a book club. We've talked about this for a number of years and I don't know that we've actually done it, but we think that's a great, great thing to do to bring people together in small groups. And we have resources that we can use from you know, Compassion, the Charter, et cetera, to encourage discussion of issues that relate to our mission. We also may have what we call kindness conversations. And as Barbara mentioned, the initiative that Pam developed a few years ago with the collaboration between the college students and the seniors could be a model for that. We also plan to have our luncheon return in person. And that's always, I think it's really one of the highlights of the year. And you saw some of the, the pictures from some of those events. It's really inspiring to, to bring an excellent speaker together. And then to have just the energy of people coming together from across our community, from so many different uh, you know, types of organizations. We also plan to do a survey of our partners to try to identify what are some ways that we could do a better job or more things that would publicize and promote the work that they're already doing. And how could we collaborate with them? Of course, we're already doing this in terms of collaborations, but we always want to focus on what can we do uh, more of, what could be better done. And you know, are there some things we're doing that aren't having such good results? Look at that as well. If we focus on some of the challenges we have, I think this is important to do because I'm sure that every compassionate city has some challenges uh, they, that they've encountered in the past, things that they have right now. So I think it's good to talk about some of the things that, some of the challenges that we've had. Just, just for me personally, even though if you look at our description in the, uh, the website and other points that have already been mentioned today, we do have a clear mission, I think, and vision. But in practice, I think it's a challenge sometimes to really communicate what that is, because a lot of people don't really understand what our mission is. And sometimes we may or some of, some of the board members may not have a clear understanding. So I think it's always good to, to remind ourselves of what that mission is, what the vision is, what, and the vision. And then to look at, okay, what are we going to do to bring that mission and that vision forward? So getting down into the specifics of really who are we, what do we do, how do we do it, and, and who does what, you know, the nitty gritty. So that's kind of an ongoing challenge. The other thing is we're an all volunteer organization as uh, Pam mentioned early on. So we don't have any paid staff, although we do, as she said, pay some contractors occasionally for some things, but it's just a challenge to have a volu all volunteer organization. It takes a lot of time, a lot of effort and continued effort. So obviously there's a workload involved and I can tell you for a fact that, that Pam, not only Pam and Barbara and myself, others have done lots and lots of work. And one of the things there is deciding again, who's gonna do what? We don't need to have everybody do everything. So I think we've started to get more specific about who is doing what, but it's still a challenge with the, with the workload. And with that, hey, there's probably, there's gonna be some turnover. There's gonna be a turnover in any organization or board. And we've had that. 
but we've also been able to bring on new people. But one of the things I think we have to think about is, are we having, you know, some burnout, you know? We don't want to burn people out. And uh, sometimes the way to handle that is some people just need to take a break. Uh, they can rotate off the board, et cetera. But I think that's a, just a natural thing that any organization has to deal with. And of course it leads to recruiting new board members. And that's something that I think we have to you know, continue to do to find people who are, who really bring something to the board. They don't have to be necessarily you know, of any particular age. And we do like to have diversity on the board in every way. So we're always you know, looking at that. And let's see here, marketing of our activities. Marketing, I think, is an ongoing issue. And let me go back here. Okay, previous. Yeah. Okay. So Barbara mentioned a lot of the, the marketing that we do. Uh, she does a great job of managing the, the, the website, posting on Facebook, et cetera. And there's just a lot of ongoing work to do there. For some of those Facebook posts, we'll do a boost to increase the, the visibility of whatever that uh, thing is that we're talking about. We also use constant contact for our email marketing and to you know, let people know what we're, what we're doing to promote events, et cetera. We also have found that it's very helpful in addition to that, to reach out to our personal networks. A number of us are on Facebook, but everybody has a network of some sort, right? Whether you have emails going out to people or just personal contact. And I think personal contact is, is always going to be very important. If somebody that you know gets something from you, they're far more likely to respond to that than somebody who doesn't know anything about you or about the organization. We also, as Barbara mentioned, we collaborate with our, our partners and that's a, an ongoing challenge, but it's also a great opportunity to extend what we do and then also extend what they do and have this cross uh, pollination, cross fertilization, because as Pam talked about the diversity of the Houston area, we, we can't overstate uh, the depth of that uh, diversity. So the more we can do to create connections between people, organizations, I think the more that we're doing our job. Another way that we've experimented with in terms of getting our message out is press releases. And I don't know that that's been so successful, but uh, you know, that's just something we have tried to do or have done. We'll probably you know, experiment with that going forward. Updating our contact database. Our contact database is basically in constant contact. And we have several thousand contacts in there. But one of the challenges is we haven't really updated that database. And as a result, we when we send an email out, maybe 15% of the emails are getting open, something like that which is not, not unusual for organizations. But again, that's an area that we could use some more focus on. Uh, this also leads into fundraising. That's another, another important issue for any organization to, to stay in place. So all of those things that we've talked about in terms of communications, collaboration, et cetera, that helps us with our fundraising. Another challenge I would say that we have is just to measure our results. And we do that already, I'm sure, in terms of uh, knowing, or in a lot of cases, how many people attend our events. But I think for, for many reasons, it's important to have some way of measuring our results. So those are just some of the challenges we have, uh, have had and do have. And now we'd just like to shift it to in the time we have left to see if you have any questions for us. We also are interested in any comments anybody has about challenges you've had in your own work as a compassionate city, any solutions you found, any suggestions for us. 
And we also don't want to, to uh, leave without saying how much we appreciate the work that all of you do uh, as a compassionate city, anything you do, and for, for participating with us today. So I'm gonna turn it over to Mimi and her co-host there. <laughs> Thank you. Let us know if we have some, some I warned that there would be a co-worker with me. <laughs> so uh, working from home with COVID, in COVID, not with COVID. Um, <laughs> I want to thank you all for this presentation. It was very comprehensive and I also just really value your transparency. I think a lot of people here involved in their own community community initiatives can appreciate um, your honesty about challenges faced and obstacles. Um, but all that aside, the work that you are doing is so inspiring and impressive. Um, and thank you for sharing it with us. Uh, I do wanna give folks a little time to drop questions or comments in the chat box, especially Ted in response to your query. But I had a question. Um, could of you speak to what you are happiest about or most proud of in the work that you've been doing? Great. Who would like to take that? Maybe Pam? Wow, that is a, that's a, an amazing question. I, I guess for me, um, the thing that's most satisfying is just seeing the growth, um, both of our partner organizations and also the variety of the things that we offer um, and being able to sort of during the pandemic it felt like we were sort of flexible and put on our creative hats in order to do the things we did in 2020 so that's I would say the things that I'm proudest of and others might have a different answer I would just say that I really like the, <clears throat> the breadth of things that we do and also the depth, because <clears throat> if you look at compassion integrity training, that's really going deep. Um, so those are very important, I think, to me. And then also, I would say that what I really enjoy maybe the most is bringing people together. So when you have, like, for example, the luncheon, it's very exciting have all these different uh, people coming, people that some you know, some you don't know, you're always meeting new people and uh, with this common bond that we have to, to spread compassion. I think what I can add, uh, there's not actually much that I can add to what Pam and Ted already uh, shared. Uh, what, what stands out for me at this point is that, you know, 2020 was a challenging year with COVID and going virtual and really the question, you know, can we reach out and can we offer virtual events that, that really reach our audience? And I have to say, we did step outside the box, for example, with our virtual compassion week. And it was just amazing to see how you can still, you know, if you are created and think outside the box, how you can create connection and how you stay connected and how you can offer really value during times of, of challenge. And so this, these times of challenge actually became for us an opportunity to, you know, to, to grow and create something new and, um, you know, st uh, stay true to our, our aim. So that was pretty amazing to see how all of these virtual events, um, you know, added to the quality of, um, uh, events and programs that we can offer and to see the testimonials of people who experienced it and the good it did. Thank you. Thank you all. That was wonderful. Um, our executive director is here <laughs> from the charter and I think she's posing a bit of a challenge to you. Um, she wrote in chat that the California legislature just passed a resolution declaring California the first compassionate state in the US. And she says, what about Houston leading the effort for Texas to become a compassionate state? <laughs> yeah, I just, I hadn't thought about that, but that's that's a, a nice challenge. Uh, yeah, I like that. <laughs> it's a wonderful wanted... challenge. I agree. All we need to do is kind of like meet some of those challenges that Ted brought up earlier so that we have a bit more labor and working force to, to carry out that effort. But I know that there are wonderful 
companions to do that with the other compassionate cities in Texas. So I think that's something that we could take a look at and see how we might be able to realistically cooperate with them in doing that. Any other thoughts, Barbara or yeah, Ted? Well, I love this idea. Uh, I'd say uh, practically, um, let's put this on for next year <laughs> <laughs> uh, with all the other events coming up. But uh, that's a truly interesting question, how to you know, expand it to a compassionate state and would be a wow uh, uh, to add Texas to that list following California. Yeah, be great. I really put you on the spot there. <laughs> <laughs> um, there was someone, I'll need to go off and find her name again, who uh, mentioned that she loved the compassionate book mm -hmm. idea, your book club, and that she would like to be involved. So I just want to say to everybody here that I did drop the email in chat for Compassionate Houston. It's compassionatehouston at gmail.com. And um, please reach out to them. They are fielding all of your questions, should you have them. And I know that you would love more involvement. Yeah, and I would just say that the, what the pandemic has done, among many other things, is it's gotten a lot of people on things like Zoom, right? So people who never might have, who might before not have thought about doing things on Zoom would do things like a book club. So really, we have the ability to reach people in our area and just anywhere. So I think it's a great idea. Okay, well, um, I think that that's all the questions from chat. Do you all have any parting words or? Well, just I would just be interested to know if anybody on the call from another compassionate city, if you have any, not necessarily a question, but any, any comments about things that either a big challenge you have or solutions you found or just something that is important to you to, to share with us. I'm gonna give people a second. And sure. of course, remind remind right. them that that email is also a great place to- Right. Sure. Yeah, just wanted Afterwards. to how to use the, the email for any follow-up question that people have. So we do, we, we do monitor the-, the um, email box and we'll, we'll respond. Yeah, the other thing that I just want to say is that in some of the discussions that we've had, you know, as a board and some of our activities, sometimes someone will have the idea that, well, our organization should, should be a certain way or we should already have something figured out. And the way that I look at it is the work that we do is very creative. So you have a mission, you have a vision, but now how do you go about uh, meeting that mission, meeting that vision? So that's why you know, compassion through the arts, to me, it was kind of a natural thing to do because the arts are so creative. And I would say that what we're doing and what other cities are doing, it's, it's very creative work. This is not just one way to do what we're doing. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure we all come up to different cities with different ways of doing different things. So uh, it's great to, to learn about those through these type of uh, meetings. I appreciate the, the charter for putting them on. Yes, and I would also I just that. like oh. to say that if people um, think of questions, great. Please send those to our Gmail. But also, if you think of things that you can share with us about your own experience, like Ted mentioned, we would love to hear those after the fact too. Sometimes these are the kinds of things that occur to you as you're driving along after you've heard something and you get a brilliant thought and go, oh, I should have said that, but it's not too late. We'd be glad to hear from you anytime. And Ted, I just wanted to say I loved uh, your likening the compassionate city work to creative work. Um, our executive director, Marilyn, wrote that St. Augustine is another compassionate city that does a lot of work in the arts and thinking about compassionate California. So I think that's a commonality across initiatives that, that this really is creative heart work. It so, is. 
Yeah, thank you for mentioning that. And um, <laughs> I uh, read doesn't agree. Um, I will be in the email I send out with the recording. I just want to let everyone know I will be um, including the email address for Compassionate Houston and also the links that I posted in this chat. So there will be plenty of um, options and uh, time for follow up. So. I would like to just quickly state something. I saw some um, chats popping up. Um, haven't clicked on them to open them, but I saw them popping up. People expressing their gratitude towards a compassionate use. And then I want to say, you know, thank you so very much for such comments. And um, we have received, as I mentioned, testimonials. And so that kind of, for me, shows that we 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 do a good job in in meeting the needs and to see people appreciating what we offer in collaboration with others, you know, really for me means 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 a lot um, as someone whose personal mission is to make a difference. And so thank you very much. And may I also add that don't forget to take that YouTube off of chat and watch it when you have time. Um, and that's another thing that if there are reactions to that or thoughts about it that we might use as we carry forward in our compassion through the arts work, you could send those ideas to us too. And that would be great. Thank you. Yes, thank, thank you, Mimi. Thank you, Mimi. Yeah, thank you all. It's been you all. so great. We really have. Yeah. Thank you, Reed. Yes. <laughs> the co-host. Thank you um, for your just openness, your availability, uh, your presence within the Compassionate Community Network. I'm always thankful for Compassionate Houston. And thank you yeah. especially today for your um, personal compassion with me as a <laughs> change in child care plans. Yeah. Um, I really yeah. appreciate it. It's great to have a new compassionate citizen with us. That's right. And nothing's more important than good parenting. Right. <laughs> Thank you all. And Thank for you. our uh, listeners, look for an email from me in the next day or two. Okay. Thank you all. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye, -bye. Bye, -bye. Bye. <laughs>